Our study this morning is 1 John chapter 2, the first six verses. Before I read the passage, you'll remember that for months now I've been telling you to keep your eyes on Israel, and if we see Iran attack Israel, we need to look up because Jesus is coming. Well, as you are all aware now, that happened yesterday. Iran has engaged. I think the next thing that we need to look for is Russian involvement. But all of this to say Jesus is coming and we need to be ready. And because we need to be ready, a Bible study like the one that we have this morning is really essential. I've been praying and praying and praying that you would really take it to heart today. 1 John chapter 2 begins this way, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know that we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Father, help us to walk. Jesus, you said to follow you. Let us be that be the place where we set our sight to go, Lord. Father, I ask you to bless the teaching of your word today. I know that you will bless the hearts of those who are here and seeking to find you or to hear from you. And for any of you who are here in this service or coming to the other services today, Lord, if they are not yet yours, not yet born again, well then call them by name and ask them to be yours. Add to your family. Father, I want to close <clears throat> this prayer by praying for the peace of Jerusalem. I know that when we pray that, we're praying for the return of the Prince of Peace. And Jesus, I can almost sense you getting up from that seat at the right hand of your Father in heaven. As you get up, Lord, to call your church home to you, help us to make use of all of the time we have left. May it be spent for you and you alone and for your glory. All of this I pray in your wonderful name. Amen. I think Prince of Peace is a good name with the world in the condition that we're in right now. If you were on trial for your life, who would you want to defend you? Would you want somebody like Thomas J. Henry? <laughs> somebody who has these fabulous jets and all these huge awards that go on the screen with little tiny small print that you can't read? Or maybe you'd want the mad guy. Jim Adler, he's mad. No, I don't know how many of you have heard Jim Adler in Spanish, but he sounds much angrier in Spanish. <laughs> Or would you want the four guy? The four guy. Now, if you're my age, we come from a blessed time. We remember when lawyers weren't allowed to advertise. It was illegal. In 1977, the Supreme Court did away with that by ruling that lawyers had the right to advertise like everyone else. Well, these are the kind of advertisements that we benefit from. Sort of, maybe, I don't know. But what if your lawyer was Jesus? And he could have an advertisement, and his advertisement simply said, Jesus Christ, perfect record. Never lost a case, never even had a case go to the jury. His record is perfect. He is front and center in these six verses today as your attorney and mine, when the accuser of the brethren, the devil, accuses us night and day before the throne of God. 
And guess what? He's not mad. Jesus doesn't need a fleet of jets. Jesus doesn't need a cute phone number, all fours. Jesus simply says, let me handle your case. So John begins, my dear children. Now we need to remember that John is very old. This greeting, I think, reflects both his age and his love for the people. My dear children, and we're going to see this throughout this chapter. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. John is really big on statements of fact. This is why I'm writing this. We don't have to guess. We don't have to interpret. In fact, I think the best thing about 1 John is that it requires no interpretation at all. We just read it and take it for what it says. Now, John quickly changes his tone at the beginning of this chapter for this specific reason. Remember from our study last time, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. And John understands that because forgiveness is as near as asking for it, that there are going to be people, it's our human nature, who say, well, if it's that easy to be forgiven, I might as well just go ahead and sin, and God's going to forgive me anyway. Now, I hope that sounds strange to your ears, but it is not strange to the professing Christian culture in the world that we live in. John wants to make sure that no one is able to misread his intent here. Yes, forgiveness is easy. We talked about that in our study last Sunday. And I'm glad that it's easy. I'm glad that it doesn't take a PhD in something. All you have to do is read it, believe it, and accept it. And John wants us to know it's not a license to sin. There's no cheap, easy grace in view in this letter. So what he does, he announces that these things are written so that we do not sin. What's the secret of not sinning? It's pretty simple. We go back to the first chapter. We have to choose to walk in the light instead of in the dark. None of us sins when we're walking in the light. When we tell you, just be with Jesus. When you're hanging around with Jesus, you're not going to do things that you know you ought not to do. It's when we start straddling the line between light light and darkness. That's when we find ourselves in a little bit of trouble. A lot of sin would happen if we were never in the places that we knew we ought not to be, doing things that we ought not to do. So John says, I write these things so that you do not sin. I want everyone in this room to understand that you don't have to sin again. Now, we're flesh, and we're going to make mistakes. We're going to do things that we don't want to do. That's just the imperfect nature of who we are. But none of us ever needs to sin again. And when you understand that, then you are fighting sin and temptation from a position of victory instead from a position of helplessness. Now what follows makes it clear that John understands our sin nature. Again, he knows that we're going to fail occasionally. But his point here is such a wonderful point because God is so generous with his forgiveness We ought to be filled with gratitude. And gratitude is the single greatest power on earth. When we are grateful to God for what he's done, when we're grateful that even when we mess up, his arms are open wide and we can come to him, well, then our lives will never be characterized by sin. Now, practically speaking, and this is a very practical Bible study, it means that Jesus wants to hang out with you wherever you go. You know, it's not enough to get up in the morning and have your devotions. It's not enough to get up in the morning and say one of those flare prayers before you go to work. Jesus is like a little kid. He says, hey, can I go to work with you? He wants to be the center of your life. He wants to be the focus of your life. And if you're hanging out with Jesus, if you understand his love for you, if you understand that he loves being with you, it will change the decisions that you make, the choices that you make, every day. He is using here in human terms, he's saying, I can't wait for you to get up every morning and check in with me so we can find out what adventure lies ahead on this particular day. This is the reason Jesus would say to you that he lived and died. He did it just to be with you. 
And I hope and I pray that you will finally get to the point where you actually learn to hate not being with him. Those days when you get really busy and then you realize, hey, an hour has gone by and I haven't even talked to Jesus. I want to get you to that place where you'll hate those days. Because if you get to that place, you will overcome sin. I want to repeat that there's no easy or cheap grace to be found in these letters at all. He says, but if anybody does sin, and obviously he knows our human nature, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Enter Jesus Christ, the attorney. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Now, this is the good news, and this to me is spectacular. The good news is that when we do fail, when temptation wins for the moment, and I pray it's only for the moment, Jesus is still there waiting to plead your case. I think sometimes we think we can hide our sin from Jesus. We don't talk about it. It's like it never really happened. But all we have to do when we sin is go to Jesus, our defense attorney, and ask for forgiveness. We can accept the responsibility of our sin. Then we can repent and begin walking in fellowship with Jesus all over again. And the one that makes it possible is our super defense attorney, Jesus Christ. We need a super defense attorney because the one who's accusing us night and day before the throne of God is the enemy of our souls. He is also supernatural in power. And he is constantly, constantly before the throne of God accusing you, accusing you of all kinds of things. Jesus, aren't you sorry you died for him or died for her because look what they're doing. I saw this and I saw that. And I think Jesus is just sitting there listening to him. And he's looking at him with this look that says, look, are you done yet? Because you're talking about one that I love. When the devil has no more accusations, Jesus simply pronounces each and every one of us innocent. He doesn't say not guilty. He pronounces us innocent of all charges. Now, we know that we're guilty. In real time, we know that we committed the sin. But there's sort of a spiritual double jeopardy attached here. And when Jesus is pronounced as innocent, we can't ever be brought up on those charges again because he already took the punishment for our sins. And because he did that, there's no evidence that suggests that you did anything wrong at all because his blood wipes away the charges against us. Now, I hope that's as wonderful a news for you as it is for me. This may shock you, but I'm not perfect. I love the fact that I can go to my defense attorney each and every day and say, God, I didn't mean to do that. I'm so sorry. That's not what I wanted to do. And he says, innocent, no problem. And fellowship is restored. That means I'm connected to the source of power in my life. It's why the book of Hebrews declares that Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. This is an attorney that never goes home. He never takes a day off. He's available to you at all times and all days. Jesus is our defense lawyer. We also know from the Gospels that all judgment, <clears throat> excuse me, has been given to him. So think about what that means about your trial and mine. The trial is fixed. You can't lose. Jesus is your lawyer. He's your character witness. He's the judge. And he's the jury. Again, it means that we can't possibly lose. So the next time you fall into unintentional sin... Instead of thinking about how disappointed God is in you or how badly or how many times you've blown it, think about the fixed trial that you cannot lose. One day, face to face, we're going to see that confident look of victory on Jesus' face. Well, that is the confident look of victory that each and every one of us has at our disposal all day, every day. Now, given that information we have to ask the question again in this chapter. Why do we have such a hard time accepting 
how easy it is to get right with God. Why do we listen to the condemnation from the enemy when Romans 8, 1 says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? Do we have enough faith to believe that your trial, your personal trial, is fixed every day? And once you're pronounced innocent, the judge, Jesus, who's also your defense attorney, he says you are free to go. And what we're free to do is not free to sin, but we're free not to sin, and we're free to walk with him wherever he leads. You know, our biggest mistake, I think, in dealing with sin is that we take it either too lightly or we take it too severely. If we take it too lightly, it encourages more sin. It's not a big deal. Dealing with it too severely means that we walk in guilt and condemnation all the time. So what's the key? The key is balance. Trusting in what he said and really trusting in your heart to want to be right with the Lord. We should hate our sin enough to stop it. But when we do sin, we can understand and accept the gift of God, the gift of forgiveness that we've been given. Well, verse 2 is how it happened. Verse 2 says, he is the atoning sacrifice. Uh, Other translation says, the propitiation. It's a word that means that he bought us. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, John is pointing out something that's very important. You guys all understand it, but I think sometimes we forget it. There is only one acceptable sacrifice for sin. You see, the problem with the world is sin. Jesus is holy, can't look upon sin. So there has to be something done with our sin. And because only Jesus lived, only Jesus lived a perfect life. Only Jesus died for your sins. Only Jesus accepted the punishment that a just God must mete out for sin. That explains why he is the only way to heaven. That's why I say all the time, and people really hate it when I say it, but only born-again Christians are going to be in heaven because only born-again Christians have the blood of Jesus Christ covering our sin. Everybody else is going to have to deal with this sin problem. Now, it's not because we're better than other people. It's not because our religion is different than others. It's not because we're more spiritual. None of those things are true. We all know that. It's simply because... Only the blood of Jesus covers us from all sin. That's why Jesus was able to say that he was the only way, the only truth, and the only source of life. So this isn't about any of the things that the world would think it is. You know, you Christians think you're better than most. It's not that at all. It's just that we're covered. Our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, when you read in verse 2, in verse 2, that his blood is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. That doesn't mean that Jesus' death is efficient, or I like to use the word effective, for the whole world. This doesn't mean that somehow everybody's going to make it to heaven. I know that sounds like a wonderful thing, but really it's not. Can you imagine getting to heaven and finding that there's still darkness there? There's still pain, there's still sorrow. What it means is very simply that his death was effective only for those who believe and receive, but it was efficacious or sufficient for the sins of the whole world. It's not the drop of blood. It's not that. It's just his death is able to cover the sins of the whole world in order to have our sins forgiven. All we have to do is accept the free gift of eternal life. Jesus told Nicodemus in the third chapter of John's gospel that you must be born again. Paul later writes, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So that's the foundation for the rest of the book of 1 John. So as we get into it this morning, The question is, how do we know that we're among those who are really going to heaven? In this chapter, John gives us three tests. We're only going to get to one of them today. And the first test is the moral test. Look at verse 3. 
We know, and there's always an emphasis there. John wants us to know for sure. This actually could be translated by this. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. Please highlight the word obey. I don't have to tell you what the Greek means. It means obey. It means you get up in the morning, you confess him as Lord, you know he's in charge, and you're going to do whatever he tells you to do. Now, we all of us struggle with questions about who really is saved or who isn't saved. We know we can't see into a man's heart or a woman's heart to find out where they really stand with the Lord. We don't have to. Remember, God knows those who are his. God won't be mocked. But John's point here is that authentic Christianity, genuine Christianity, can be physically observed. You can look at your life. I can look at your life. Other people are looking at your lives as Christians, and they can say, I'm watching how they live. I'm watching the way they talk. Yesterday in the Masters Golf Tournament, there was a professional golfer. I won't give you his name. I'm sure he's repented by now. But he has for years, and he's been on tour for maybe 15, 18 years. And he's been very loud about his Christianity in a good way, in a very positive way. And his character has always been at least publicly exemplary. Well, yesterday in the Masters Golf Tournament, some of the fans were giving him a hard time. He just had a triple bogey on one of the holes. And when he finally got in the hole, some of the fans started clapping like, you finally got it done. And he cursed at them loudly and publicly and using worst possible word. Now we can look at that and say that's not what public Christianity ought to look like. Now I use that illustration because I want you to examine your own life. What kind of language comes from your mouth? Do you gossip? Do you lie? Ugly words? Say, well, it's not that big a deal. It's a really big deal. John's point is that genuine Christianity can be physically observed. And he says here the first step to observing a genuine Christian is watching their obedience to the word of God. As John would write this, he would remember Jesus' words. If you love me, you will obey me, Jesus said. And what he's saying here is that a real believer loves God's word. He or she understands that God has given us clear directions for how we should live our lives and we ought to be men and women who seek those directions. It shouldn't be sort of a, a, a just, well, did I do good or didn't I do good? We can know what to do and how to do it. Please hear this. Obedience makes your life easier, not harder. I think sometimes we've got it backwards. We think, well, if I'm going to obey God, it's going to be really, really hard. It's not. Have you ever heard somebody say, it's really hard to be a Christian? It's not. It's much, much harder not to be. But John is saying that authentic Christianity can be physically observed, and obedience proves not only that we belong to him, but that we trust him in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, there's no one in this room who ever struggles with the assurance of their salvation when we're walking in the light, when we're obedient to the Lord. It's when we stray off into the darkness that we begin to have the doubts. It's when we stray off into the darkness that the enemy of our souls comes and pours out condemnation on us and asks us questions like, well, what makes you think you're really saved? That's when doubt creeps in. And that's why John emphasizes the word no, K-N-O-W, he uses it 40 times in this letter alone. 25 of those times it's used as it is here in the continuous present tense, meaning that we've come to know or we have learned through experience. It's not something we have to guess about or doubt. Now, I'm confident, at least this is the desire of this pastor's heart, I'm confident all of you who belong to Christ know beyond any doubt you're going to heaven. And we see that cruise missiles and ballistic missiles and attack drones are on the way to Israel. If you're not certain that you're going to heaven, it's going to terrify you. 
When I say Jesus is coming, he's coming soon. If you're not certain you're his, that's going to scare you to death. And John says, I want you to know where you stand and we all of us can know. He also uses it 15 times in the perfect tense, meaning that we've come to know these things as fact. And that's what he wants you to do. He wants you to hold on to those things that you know as fact. And when the enemy tries to cause doubt, you can do a course correction if you've strayed a little bit in the darkness, or you can just say, you know what, I don't want to talk to you. Jesus, you handle him. And that's the way I like to keep my relationship with the devil. John is absolutely adamant, and repetition is the tool that he uses throughout this letter. He wants us to know these things in such a way that they provide comfort and security in our lives rather than the fear of losing our standing with God as happens to so many professing Christians. Remember your defense attorneys never lost a case. And all you have to do is know for sure where you stand. On the other hand, in verse 4 he says, The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now remember, this all starts with Gnosticism. We talked about that the very first study in 1 John. The Gnostics believe that Jesus didn't come in the flesh because God is spirit and spirit and flesh have nothing to do with one another. And so what they were saying was that we can go in and sin because it doesn't matter what we do in the flesh. Now we don't call it Gnosticism anymore. We call it progressive Christianity. And we still believe the same thing that it's okay. Well, John says, in case you think it's okay, if you think God understands why you're doing what you're doing, if you think God is okay with it, John just said that you're a liar and the truth isn't in you. For the Gnostics, for the progressive Christian, and I always like to use the term so-called Christian, you know where you stand with the Lord. Your lives prove who you really are. The choices you make every day defines who you are. You can say Jesus to your blue in the face, but if you're not walking with him in the light, remember that's what John said in the first chapter, in him is light, there's no darkness at all. If you're not walking with Jesus in the light, what makes you think that you can claim to be his? We go back a verse and John says authentic Christianity can be observed. Now you might be thinking, well, nobody's perfect. Nobody expects you to be. But the one thing that all of us ought to do is hate when we're not perfect. Not hate it to the point where you beat yourself up, but just hate it. God, I disappointed you again. I disappointed me again. I don't want to do that. Lord, my witness has been compromised in your homes. If you're guilty of compromising your witness, I want you to understand you've got children who are watching. Paul, when he's writing to the Ephesians, he says to fathers, fathers do not exasperate. Another translation says embitter your children. Well, the thing that exasperates your kids, the thing that embitters them, is watching you say one thing and live something else. And your genuine Christianity needs to be observable in your home or your kids are just going to throw their hands up and wonder, well, what's the point? We all know that we're accused of being hypocrites. So a bunch of people calling themselves Christians who blame you for not being in church today. Well, I, I'd go to church, but it's full of hypocrites. That ought to be their invitation. <laughs> but we should hate when we're hypocrites. We talked in our previous studies in chapter 1 about being different. When I got saved, I hope it's true for you, when you got saved, you understood that you couldn't keep living the way you'd been living before. You couldn't keep saying the same things or doing the same things. You couldn't keep making the same excuses for walking in the darkness. You understood that there is a judge. And too often we hear the word judge. 
And we think, oh yeah, the judge is against us. Not this judge, remember. He's for you. He's the judge. He's the defense attorney. He's your character witness. And what Jesus wants you to understand is that in everything, he's for you. And he wants you to demonstrate that your Christianity is genuine. Now, this is as clear as it can be. It, it's very blunt. There's no nuance here. There's nothing that's difficult to understand. God loves everyone. But the truth is, not everyone loves God. Now, as a born-again believer, you're going to say, I love God. But I think we sort of measure our love. I love you, Lord, but right now, this sin that I'm contemplating, I love more. And we find a way somehow to rationalize that. Now, understand there's an enemy who's helping you come to those conclusions. But Jesus is simply saying to you, let's just get rid of all of the junk, all of the worldly stuff. And he's trying to get us to be honest about whether or not we really love him. It's not enough to love Jesus most of the time. Jesus, again, he said, if you love me, you'll obey me. If your obedience is measured out, if your obedience is inconsistent, then can you be honest enough today to say that, Lord, you know what? My love is sort of crummy. When things are going good, I love you, but when I'm tempted or when things aren't going well, I find that my love has severe limits. And you can ask the Holy Spirit to remove those limits. John says if we loved him, we'd obey him, and everyone in the world around you would be able to identify you as a genuine Christian. There are simply too many professing Christians who don't live a life that is consistent with their profession of faith. We live lives characterized, instead of obedience, characterized by disobedience. And we try to pretend like God is okay with it. He's not. Ask yourself the question, is it possible, is it even remotely possible that someone who is living in a continual lifestyle of sin, is it possible that they could belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? And we want to be sure, this first test, this moral test, we want to be sure that that doesn't describe us. Just because someone attends church, just because you've been baptized, just because you come to Calvary Chapel, just because you're a really nice man or a really nice woman, none of that says anything about your salvation. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. That's what the Holy Spirit is saying to each and every one of us. John says he wants us to know for sure. There's more to this test. Verse 5. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete or made perfect in him. And then he says, this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. The must is intentional. It's not a suggestion. It's direction. How do we know for sure that we're in Christ, that we're with Jesus, that we love him? We know for sure because we're walking with him. Now, you probably have already picked this up, but verse 6, John just said, just be with Jesus. You're going to find this on almost every page of your New Testament regardless of who the author is. Just be with Jesus. If you obey God's word, God's love is made perfect in you. You want to know what to do. You want to know what he doesn't want you to do. You want to know what pleases the Lord. The Apostle Paul writes that we're to find out what pleases the Lord. And that's what verse 5 is saying. This is the test. Is that the desire of your heart every morning? You get up and say, Lord, here I am. I am your servant. What's on your agenda for me today, Lord? How can I please you today? I'm a visual person, at least in my mind. And I like to imagine Jesus' face smiling. 
Lord, how can I please you today? You know, men, if you get up in the morning and ask your wife that question, I promise you're going to have a good day, you and your wife together. Ladies, if you get up and ask your husband that question, things are going to go well. If that's what your children see in your home, it's going to change the entire atmosphere of your home. Why? Well, I love God's Word. I think too often, especially in this world that hates God's Word and hates God, and I think sometimes we're too uncomfortable with the idea that people might think badly of us if we declare publicly that we love God's Word. It's a decision that you've got to make. If you obey His Word, God's love is truly made complete. And here's the final test. Whoever claims to live in Him must walk as Jesus did. John wants to make sure that we get this. There's a huge difference in knowing about Jesus and knowing Him personally. There's a huge difference. You're all here because you know about Jesus. But do you know Him personally? And if you know Him personally, you know you can't change who He is It was just a few Sundays ago in our Palm Sunday message when Jesus came into the streets of Jerusalem at exactly the right moment, fulfilling prophecy with specificity. And the people were disappointed in him. And I think too many of us as believers are disappointed in Jesus because he won't let us do the stuff that we want to do. When God says no, how do you respond? It was a Bible study that I just this Wednesday night with King David. When King David was told no by God, David fell down and worshipped him. Who am I, O God, that you would make me these wonderful promises? How do you respond when God says no? How do you respond when the Holy Spirit knocks on the door of your heart and says, look, how about you fix things at home? How about you be my man or my woman in a marriage that I want to fix? What if the Lord were to say to you today, I I want you to fix things at home with your children. I want your children to know that you love me. No excuses, no apologies. I want your kids to see that you love me, and I want them to understand that there's going to be discipline in the home. See, this is the test. This is how we can know we're His and how we can have security in all of the promises. We need to remember that He's light in Him. There's no darkness at all. John told us that in the very first chapter, and that theme is going to run through the rest of this book. Does verse 6 describe your life? If not, in just a couple of moments, you're going to have an opportunity to change that. You're going to have the opportunity to come forward and repent. But it requires that you be honest. Now, probably, in a general sense, there's nobody in this room who's disagreed with the thing that I've said today. The test for you is, are you going to let what you've heard today change you. I can leave here today the same man or the same woman with the same problems, with the same complaints. Or are you going to be the man or the woman who recognizes that, you know, my life doesn't look very much like yours, Lord. And I'm sorry about that. I don't want that ever to happen again. And you can make those changes. as it relates to the world that we live in, you've got to see the world through his eyes. I think of Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus, and he wept bitterly. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He wasn't mourning Lazarus' death. He was weeping because of the pain in this world. He saw the mourners. He saw the ravages of sin. 
We can't even imagine what it was like to be the one who said, let there be light, and there was, and he made everything and came to the conclusion finally after making Adam and Eve that it was very good. And Jesus would have said, this doesn't look anything like what I created. And when we see the ravages of sin, when we see the pain in the world, if we're walking as he walked, it's going to break our hearts. We're not going to overlook it. We're not going to just pretend that it doesn't happen. We're going to stand with him and for him. We're going to stand for righteousness in a world that doesn't want to hear about righteousness. That takes courage and it takes faith. And I think the call for that kind of courage and that kind of faith is only going to get louder and louder as we near the return of our Lord for his church. We don't know how much more time that we have, but here's what we know, that we need to fill every minute of it with the work that he's called us to do. Jesus had one mission on earth, and that was to die. And for more than 33 years, every step he took was one step closer to death. If we're going to walk like he did, every step that we take has to be one step closer to that moment when he calls us to be with him in the air. Do you hate sin? Do you hate the effects of sin? Do you hate the fact that, well, there are times like the golfer who blow it? Do you hate that? I can promise you that that golfer this morning hates what he said. And we can rationalize it. You know, he could say, well, you know, they were, they were giving me a hard time. They were making fun of me when I was having a really difficult time at, on the golf course. But you see, I know him well enough to know that this morning he hates it. I want you to leave here today hating the times you failed. And maybe if you hate him enough, You'll hate it the next time before you fail instead of after. Father, as we close this study this morning,